the son of a great king and a princess. He believed he was born of the gods. He conquered to the limits of the ancient known world. He was a man of great passion and excess who changed the course of history. Alexander the Great was born in Macedonia in 356 BC. He was the son of King Philip II, a general of outstanding ability and boundless energy, who had turned Macedonia into the leading power in Greece. Alexander's father was a clever politician and diplomat who succeeded in conquering the rebellious Greeks and passed his vision of a great Macedonian empire to his firstborn son. It all started in the summer of 356 when Alexander's father, Philip, was laying siege to a Greek city called Potidaea. And three messages came on the same day, we're told. One, that a general of his had won a victory. Two, that his horse had won at the Olympic Games. And three, that he was blessed with a son whom he called Alexander. From an early age, Alexander showed extreme physical courage and loyalty. While still in his teens, he tamed his legendary battle horse, Bucephalus, when everyone else had failed. This was a very wild stallion that Philip was proposing to buy, but nobody could tame the beast, and so Philip finally told people to take it away because he wasn't interested. But Alexander had noticed that the horse was very frightened of its shadow, and he very cleverly led the horse into the bright sunlight where he could not see his shadow and therefore had calmed down, and Alexander was able to approach him and finally to mount him and tame him, and so he got the horse, whom he kept for the rest of his life until the horse started at about a very advanced age of 33. Brought up to be a warrior like his father, Alexander was trained to endure hardship, but he also received a privileged education under the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle. It was at this time that he forged the friendships that were to hold fast throughout his life. Most important of these was his relationship with Hephaestion, his future lover and second in command of his army. As students of Aristotle, the two young nobles learned of the wonders of the world. They were inspired to set out and discover the unknown and achieve greatness. The other great influence in Alexander's life was his strong-willed mother, Olympias. We have no description of her appearance, but um, what we are left with from ancient accounts is the impression of a hugely passionate individual fixated upon power for herself and for herself through her son. Olympias was high priestess of a cult devoted to the god Dionysius, the rituals of which involved snake handling. Rumor has it that Alexander's father once caught her in bed with a snake but she claimed it was the god Zeus in the form of a serpent. She seems to have insinuated that um, Philip was not Alexander's true father and that he was in some way engendered by a god and so felt that he was, in the Greek sense, a hero, the son of a god. Relations between Alexander's parents were always stormy, but the final straw came when Philip took a younger wife, Cleopatra. For Alexander, his parents' separation was a disaster. He could no longer rely on being his father's natural successor. Cleopatra had powerful relatives, one of whom uh, uh, almost implied that Alexander was illegitimate. He was a bastard said, now there will be legitimate heirs for you, Philip. And uh, that led Alexander to physically attack him, throw a goblet um, of wine at his face. 
Alexander and Olympias stormed out of court and exiled themselves in Epirus, his mother's family stronghold. But after a period of cooling off, the young warrior returned to court to secure his birthright. Alexander's position was still very precarious. Shortly after his return, his father was assassinated, leaving a baby son and potential heir. Alexander was immediately suspected of causing his father's death. And with Philip dead, a rebellion blew up in Greece. Alexander had to act immediately and decisively. He seized the throne and murdered all those who posed a threat to his succession, including his baby stepbrother. He then moved swiftly to put down the rebellion and assert himself. Alexander was able to appear on the scene against the major rebel city, Thebes, and after a relatively short engagement, captured the city, destroyed it, enslaved the population. It was an act of deliberate terror, which was meant to intimidate the rest of the Greek world. With Greece under his control, Alexander was now poised to realize his father's dream and expand his empire. He set his sights on the ancient enemy of Persia. Ruled by a warrior king, Darius III, the Persian Empire was at this time the largest and richest in the world, stretching from Egypt to the coast of Turkey, across Asia to India. Greece and Persia had been at war for nearly 200 years. Persia had invaded Greece and sacked Athens, but by Alexander's time had been pushed back to the Dardanelles. But Persia still occupied a series of Greek coastal cities in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. In 335 BC, at the age of just 21, Alexander crossed the Hellespont, the symbolic border between Europe and Asia, and began his invasion. Alexander's army numbered just 40,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry. From his father, he had inherited a strategy that was the key to his success in battle, the Macedonian phalanx. Row upon row of infantry wielding the famous 18-foot spear called the Sarissa. The advance of this murderous steel-tipped porcupine on the enemy was an invincible force and gave Alexander the means of taking on the world. I don't think he ever doubted his confidence as a commander. Um, one has to remember too that he was a commander who led his troops from the front, not from behind. And so where the first impact was, the decisive moment of the battle, there was Alexander, the head of the cavalry. And so in 334, when he invaded um, Asia Minor, then the first battle to the east of what was then Troy, he won with almost effortless ease. During the Battle of the Granicus, the Macedonians were outnumbered four to one, and Alexander was nearly killed, saved only by his trusted lieutenant and boyhood friend, Clytus. After the battle, in an act of revenge, the victorious Alexander ruthlessly massacred 20,000 Greek mercenaries who'd fought alongside the Persians. There was a conscious use of terror there, and this deterrent aspect of Alexander's policy. We see it in Thebes, we see it at the Granicus, we see it in Tyre. It is resistance, organized opposition. The reaction is always savage repression to a degree that makes one shudder. But on the other hand, if people submit to him, accept his sovereignty, then he can be overwhelmingly generous. Alexander was quickly on the move. The next major battle against Darius and the mighty Persian army was a turning point in the great campaign, the Battle of Issus. Issus was a small plain surrounded by high cliffs, making manoeuvring difficult for the huge Persian army. Alexander was able to drive the Persians into retreat so that they more or less trampled each other down in the narrows trying to escape. And so the great army of the Persian king more or less destroyed itself. 
Darius fled in his chariot and Alexander pursued him. And in the course of leaving the, site, the scene of the battle, Darius not only left his men behind, but also the royal baggage train, which contained the royal family in one of his tents. And so they fell into the hands of Alexander. The queen mother, he treated as his own mother, and Darius' wife was given all the honors of a Persian queen. Now, the point was that Alexander is from now on, if not before, claiming that he is the proper king of Persia and Darius must submit to him. There is a charming story that um, Alexander and his great friend Hephaestion went into the tent of the Queen Mother and she looked at the two of them not knowing who was whom and she actually made obeisance to Hephaestion rather than Alexander and realizing her mistake clearly thought that she'd be run through with a sword probably but Alexander is said to have smiled gently and said Hephaestion is also an Alexander. The city of Tyre fell next. It was a textbook operation in siege warfare. Darius decided to negotiate terms. Darius sent an offer back to Alexander at some stage, offering him all of the lands west of the Euphrates River, that's Iraq, to the Aegean, so a vast amount of territory, also a huge ransom for the royal women and various other concessions. And everyone assumed that Alexander would leap at such a generous offer, which must have been more than he had originally dreamt of getting. And this is one of the many set pieces between Parmenio, who was one of his father's trusted lieutenants. And on this occasion, Parmenio advises Alexander and says, I would take this offer if I were Alexander. And Alexander says, and I would take it if I were Parmenio. Rejecting the peace offer, Alexander headed for Egypt. There he was greeted as a liberator, a hero, and founded a city on the Nile Delta, Alexandria. It was the first of many to bear his name. He sought advice at an ancient oracle, the Temple of Amun. Alexander emerged apparently convinced that he was indeed the son of a god and was now truly invincible. But Darius wasn't finished yet. At Gagamela, he assembled the largest army the world had ever seen. It numbered 100,000 infantry, 40,000 cavalry, and 200 scythed chariots. Darius was determined to crush Alexander once and for all. At Gagamela in 331 BC, Alexander was just one battle away from becoming the great king and toppling the Persian dynasty. Still only 25, Alexander was increasingly sure of his invincibility and divinity. King Darius and the Persians had plenty of time to assemble a new army but Alexander was confident of victory. He decided to use a similar strategy as at the Battle of Issus to counteract the vast Persian army. With one of his brilliant use of tactics, Alexander led with his right flank. And so to counter his advance, the Persian left flank moved in order to face him, and a gap appeared in the line, and Alexander was able to break through and surround the forces and fight them on both sides. And again, it was another rout, uh, again, um, culminating in the flight of Darius. Persian city after Persian city fell, including the mighty Babylon. Alexander and his troops soon reached Persepolis, the heart of the Persian Empire. Legend has it, that he burnt it to the ground. Demoralized, Darius went on the run. He was aided by his cousin Bessus, a fierce warlord, who took over as commander of the Persian cavalry. Now, Bessus was the very formidable governor of Bactria, who'd fought at Gorgamila and stayed with King Darius until the very end when he uh, had him arrested and murdered and stabbed, and then challenged Alexander for the Persian Empire. Bessus was brutally murdered. Um, before Alexander got there, he was betrayed. And uh, uh, one legend has that he was 
tied to two trees that were bent in towards each other and then obviously torn apart when the trees were released, which is not a very pleasant death for anyone. But his head was sent to Alexander. And I think the message was very clear that Alexander was to have no competition as great king of Persia. Alexander began to adopt Persian dress and customs, much to the disgust of the Greek generals that had served under his father. This older generation regarded the Persians as no more than barbarians. Alexander started to replace the old guard with his own men. Gradually, the officers of Philip are being replaced by Alexander's men, people like Perdiccas, Ptolemy the future king, and above all, Hephaestion, Alexander's closest friend and almost certainly his lover. And um, by the end of 330, Alexander's officers are his own generation, people who owed everything to him. Alexander's behavior was becoming erratic. The tough conditions, the hard campaign trail were taking their toll and he was drinking heavily. Clitus, his savior, and one of his oldest friends, dared to criticize him at a drunken banquet. One of his, the companions who was attending this dinner, took Alexander's sword quietly away from him. I presume it had been lying on the, the couch beside him, and took the sword away because he could see what was about to happen. But in the course of this, um, when Clitus kept coming back and taunting him, he grabbed a spear from one of the servants and ran him through with a spear. The morning after the night before, he felt um, utter remorse. He was devastated at what he had done. Some say he would tried to kill himself. He was so embarrassed and so incredulous that he had actually killed a man who had saved his life at the Battle of the Granicus, whose sister had been his nanny uh, when he was a child. Others say he just went into his tent and wept for several days. But I think drink was certainly um, a, an impetus in this um, terrible, terrible episode. But Alexander's lust for conquest was still not satisfied. At the age of 29, he passed under the shadow of the Himalayas and entered Bactria, present-day Afghanistan. Alexander was impressed by these exotic people and their customs. He met a beautiful Bactrian princess called Roxanne and was bewitched by her. The sources say that she was really spectacularly beautiful and Alexander saw her and fell in love with her at first sight and actually married her rather than taking her as a concubine or whatever. And um, this was his only official marriage. And of course it was to one, a woman who would have been classed as barbarian. Um, she was not Greek, she was not Macedonian, she was a, a native of, uh, of Asia, of Afghanistan. And it is, I think, fair to say that the Macedonian noblemen would not have expected to have someone like that as their queen. Alexander left a large garrison behind in Afghanistan to protect his new queen and marched towards Pakistan and India. One by one, cities fell. Alexander's constant desire to discover the unknown and his thirst for knowledge drove him on. His old tutor, Aristotle, had led him to believe that from the heights of the Hindu Kush, they would see the waters of the endless ocean, which marked the edge of the world. The army's ascent of these mountains was an extraordinary feat in itself, but intelligence reports told him that another kingdom, not an endless ocean, lay ahead in lands that as yet were uncharted. His army, however, did not share Alexander's vision. Eight years of endless war, campaigning in some of the most inhospitable terrain in the world, had taken its toll. They wanted to go home. His intention was to penetrate to the great Indian kingdom of the Nandas around modern Patna and right in the Ganges Valley. And he was going to conquer the area because it had never been under the Persians and he was expanding the Persian Empire. But of course it was at that point that his men refused to follow him and forced him to turn back, a thing he never forgave them for. Alexander pleaded with his men not to abandon him in this hour of glory. Gentlemen of Macedonia, stand firm, for well you know that hardship and danger are the price of glory. 
and that sweet is a life of courage and of deathless renown beyond the grave. For once, his words did not inspire them. They simply would not advance any further. Alexander retired to his tent and sulked for three days. The army prepared for the road home, which lay back over the tributaries of the river Indus. With an army of this size, troop transportation problems were immense. A fleet of ships was waiting on the coast for some of them, but the rest of the army had to march back overland. A 60-day shortcut through the Gadrosian desert nearly spelled disaster for them. The journey back to the heart of his new empire safely accomplished, Alexander then tried to integrate his men into the Persian world in an effort to control it. In 324 BC, he forced his high-ranking officers into marriages with Persian nobility at a mass wedding ceremony. For Alexander's troops, it was a bridge too far. He gave them massive wedding gifts and registered the marriages, and all of his companions were married to noble Persians. And it is, I think, telling that none of these marriages survived except one. Alexander's relationship with his troops had always been inspirational. He made their hardships his own, and always led from the front in any battle. But now, as far as they were concerned, he had gone native and was losing his grip on reality. Worse was to come. In Ekbatana, Babylonia, his beloved Hephaestion died. It was a blow from which Alexander never recovered. Alexander was utterly devastated by this loss, someone who had been a very close confidant at a time when he probably had very few close friends. He was be must have been becoming increasingly isolated at that, at that stage. Um, Alexander exhibited grief that was very peculiar. He ordered the manes of all of the cavalry horses to be shorn in mourning as a sign of, of respect for his great friend. After the death of Hephaestion, Alexander drowned his sorrows in massive drinking bouts. In Babylon, he fell ill. We do know that his illness started after a great banquet held by one of his officers, Medeus, at which Alexander drank prodigiously and then was, one tradition has him take nil then and there with a pain in the back, another has him gradually generating a fever but he had something like 10 days of illness with intensifying fever. He lost his voice and in the end could only acknowledge the Macedonians as they marched past his bedside with gestures. The greatest conqueror of the ancient world died in his bed aged 33. The man who believed himself to be divine was mortal after all. It would be nice to have a theory of poisoning and a nice conspiracy, but the answer is, I think, we'll never know. The absolutely remarkable thing about Alexander is his military success. I think if one looks at um, any great military commander of any time, no one can match his record. Napoleon is quite pathetic beside him. To be invincible is something that every commander aspires to be.